been asked to give three lectures on logical structure. Um, and what I've done is I've actually um, written the, the three lectures uh, as one continuous lecture. So we'll stop where we stop, and then we'll carry on in the next two. So I hope this works. Normally, I don't do this, but um, this time it made sense to me. So the aim of the lectures is to basically say how we got to the green contours in this plot. So this is a plot that's a bit old now. It's from 2011 from the, the supernova team. And this is the matter density, cosmological matter density, and this is the cosmological uh, density in lambda. And this basically just so shows what concordance cosmology is. Each of the constraints shown by the likelihood contours, the cosmic microwave background, the supernova, and the baryon acoustic oscillation measurements give you a degeneracy in this plot when you've marginalized out all of the parameters. And any two of these likelihood contours have to meet in a point. But to have all three of them meet in a single point gives you more confidence that actually you are learning something physical about the universe from all of these different measurements. The fact that this point also lies on the, the flat cosmological models, models where omega m plus omega lambda is 1, also tells you something uh, pretty interesting. So in these lectures, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at exactly how these data were calculated, the improvements we've got at the moment beyond this plot of 2011, and the improvements we'll have in the next 10 to 20 years. And I'm also going to try and uh, give you at least a feel for the physics behind uh, what these measurements are, are actually, uh, how these measurements uh, are actually based. When you have a galaxy survey, there is an awful lot of science, cosmological science and information that you can get out from it. And that's because there's a large number of physical processes that add together to give you the observed clustering, the observed distribution of galaxies that you see. And this plot just gives you sort of a, a brief overview of some of that physics. I'm going to talk about some of these. I'm going to talk about barren acoustic oscillations. I'm going to talk about the alcott pachinsky effect and Richard space distortions. I'm not going to talk about weak lensing. I'm going to talk very briefly, depending on time, how much of the lectures I can get through, on co-moving clustering and large-scale density. Basically, from this plot, I want you to just understand that, that when you have this observation, it's not like having uh, a straightforward lab experiment where you have one measurement that you make from that experiment. Once you've got a galaxy survey, there's a whole range of different physics, a whole range of ways in which you can analyze that galaxy survey to get at different parts of physics. Okay, so let's start with the very basics. Apologies for those of you for whom this is too basic. Uh, but galaxy surveys are actually very easy to do. They're very easy to do for angular galaxy surveys. So here these two plots show a um, projection of the sky, the full sky, as observed by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and actually as observed by the imaging survey, uh, which used this camera here uh, to observe uh, using drift scan technique, uh, these patches that you see uh, in different colors. Now, all of, almost all of the light you see in these images is coming from galaxies. And just by picking up an image of the, the night sky, you can see the clustering pattern of galaxies. You can see filaments, you can see voids, you can see clusters. And this is impressive because you're seeing this simply in the projection of galaxies on the sky. So there's no radial information here. You're just seeing the angular positions of the galaxies. And these angular positions are very easy to pick up there are many, many millions of galaxies here, and you can just use whatever image analysis software you want, Sextractor, for example, and pick up all of these galaxy RA and DEC. Now, to get the most information out of a galaxy survey, you need additional information, and you want to turn the galaxy survey into a three-dimensional map. And to do that, we obviously need to take spectra of the galaxies, and from the spectra, pick up the recession velocity. So from the, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, this is the, the, from the redshifting paper by Adam Bolton. And it shows six typical galaxies that we observe within the Barron Oscillation Spectroscopic Survey. And I'll tell you a bit more about this survey in a minute. 
These are um, luminous red galaxies at low and higher redshift. This is a luminous red galaxy with a starburst component. This is a galaxy with just a starburst component. And then here we have two different quasars at different redshifts. So you see that galaxies have different spectra. They have different features within those spectra. But actually, a lot of the features are consistent. There are, for example, absorption lines in the um, luminous red galaxies that we can pinpoint, we can measure their wavelengths of, and then translate through to redshifts of those galaxies. So the Galaxy Redshift Survey history is basically driven by how many of these spectra you can obtain to give you your galaxy survey. So if we go back, what's this now, 30 years, then we have a landmark survey called the CFA survey, where they measured spectra for 3,500 galaxies. This doesn't sound very impressive until you realize that they took these spectra using a single slit on a telescope. So they basically take these spectra one at a time by pointing the telescope at each individual galaxy, measuring spectra for that galaxy, and then pointing the telescope at the next galaxy. So you can see that taking 3,500 galaxy redshifts was a major undertaking. Taking 23,000 in the same way was an even bigger achievement. And then there was this leap forwards about 15 years ago or so when um, the, the first big multi-object spectrographs were developed. So this field is, like many observational fields, driven by uh, the development of instrumentation. And the instrumentation here are multi-object spectrographs that can take many spectra of galaxies simultaneously. So we have the two-degree field galaxy redshift survey. This could take 400 spectra simultaneously. And then we have the Sloan Digital Sky Survey that can take 1,000 spectra simultaneously. So in any one pointing of the telescope on the sky, you get 400 or 1,000 spectra. And obviously that's what's driven this leap forwards in galaxy redshift surveys. They could have done these surveys back in the 1980s if they've had this instrumentation. This development of instrumentation has led to a logarithmic improvement in galaxy redshift surveys over the past couple of decades and is expected to continue at least for another 10 years or so. So this plot shows the Baron acoustic oscillation distance percentage error um, I'll explain what this means later on in the lecture, but basically you can think of this as being the precision of the experiment we want to do to measure baron acoustic oscillations against publication year back from the days when I was a postdoc through to 10 years' time. You see there's this logarithmic improvement in surveys. And again, I should highlight that this is purely uh, driven by the development of instrumentation. And provided that development of instrumentation continues, there's no reason why this can't continue for a while yet. Okay, so I've mentioned it a few times, and I'm going to give you, uh, show you some results from it and use it as a sort of benchmark galaxy survey. So let me tell you a little bit about the Baryon, Acoustic, uh, sorry, Baryon Oscillation Spectroscopic Survey, or BOSS. It was a five-year project. It was from 2009 to 2014, and it used the Sloan Telescope, 2.5-meter diameter primary mirror telescope uh, to observe uh, basically spectra of galaxies following the imaging data that I showed before. There was an upgrade to the instrumentation. Again, as I want to really emphasize, all of this observational work is driven by instrumentation developments. But it could take a thousand spectra simultaneously in any one observation. We chose to do one hour length observations which meant that in the course of a good night, you could observe 8,000 spectra. The wavelength range of the spectra was chosen so that we could get redshifts of the galaxies we were aiming at, uh, and the precision of the spectra was chosen uh, so that it gave us enough information to get good, accurate redshifts. So we covered 10,000 square degrees. We got uh, roughly 1.5 million uh, massive galaxy spectra. Uh, we also observed quasars, 150,000 quasars, uh, for Lyman Alpha Forest observations. I'm not going to talk about those uh, in these lectures, just because I have to cut some things out. And there are also various other ancillary science targets uh, for other reasons. 
So, sorry, the, the main sample I'm going to talk about is the, the galaxy sample where we're using galaxies as point particles to trace the density field in the universe. Uh, and the main uh, samples that I'll be looking at are the low redshift sample called LOZ, uh, which peaks at a redshift of around 0.3, and the CMAS sample that peaks at around a redshift of 0.57. And this is just a plot of the number density of those galaxies against redshift. So one of the big issues when you're doing a galaxy survey is what galaxies to target for spectroscopic follow-up. So you need to know what RA and DEC to point each fiber in the spectrograph at to get a particular redshift. And to do this in BOSS, uh, we wanted to select bright galaxies that were going to be easy to get the redshifts for and that were, there and were also highly biased traces of the density field. So um, because of the way, and hopefully Cloudy will talk about this later, that the, the light from a passive galaxy evolves through uh, different filters, different imaging filters, as that galaxy moves in redshift, then we decided to use two different selection functions, one at low redshift and one at high redshift. And they both basically did color cuts and magnitude cuts in order to select the galaxy populations that we follow up with spectroscopy. And then the survey is built up uh, in the following way. Each one of the little circles you can see in this uh, diagram, for example here, but then this is all composed of small circles, is one pointing of the telescope at one patch of the sky. And the telescope is observing a thousand spectra in each of these patches. And then basically as the years go by, you build up the survey by building up the pointing until hopefully, uh, well in the end, we had covered almost all of the, the survey region where we'd got imaging data and uh, got the galaxies targeted that we wanted to follow up and observe. Okay. Are there any questions about that basics of surveys before I move on to look at clustering of the galaxies within them? Everybody happy? Excellent. Do interrupt me during the the talk, don't wait until the discussion session this afternoon to give me your very difficult question if we're doing it. Maybe we're not doing that. But anyway, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just the previous graph you showed, um, are there other points where you get uh, multiple pointings that are there, like overlap? Ah, uh, okay. Overlapping regions? And so, so yes, these pointings do overlap. And that gives us an interesting issue that there's a varying completeness. So the varying number density of um, spectra that we can obtain with angular position. So you can see, I mean, we're, we're fill it, tiling the sky with circles, right? So that you're never going to do that without overlap or holes. And we chose to have overlap. So in general, in those overlap regions, we get all of the targets, spectra for all of the targets we want to. But in the regions that don't overlap, we have a lower what's called completeness. So we only have fewer spectra compared to the number of targets we have. And that's something we have to deal with. Okay, clustering. Okay. If, uh, how, how is what the highest redshift that you can get to, to survey? So uh, the question is, uh, what's the highest redshift? It, that all depends on the instrumentation and the telescope you have and how bright the galaxy is that you're observing. For BOSS, we basically targeted galaxies that had this tail out to a redshift of 0.7, and we observed redshifts for the, all of the, you know, this is all of the galaxies that we actually got redshifts for. In fact, we know now that we could have pushed this instrument slightly further, and we are doing now with the experiment we're doing after BOSS to push more to redshifts of sort of 0.9. But then beyond that, the observed brightness of the galaxies becomes too faint to be able to accurately get a redshift once you've got a spectrum. Then you need a bigger telescope. And I'll talk in my final lecture about some of the projects that are doing that. Oh. Right. Okay, so, so the question is, why is there a gap here? Okay, and the answer to that is simply that the targeting for this part was designed to primarily pick up these galaxies, 
and the targeting for this type of galaxy was primarily designed to peak at this redshift. And it just so happens that while there are galaxies here, they didn't fall within our targeting algorithm. OK? okay. Excellent. Right. Clustering. So a lot of the statistical information that comes out from a galaxy survey is encoded in what's called the two-point clustering. This, this, plot, this, this plot is actually a projection through the two-degree field galaxy redshift survey. It's basically a projection through a slice of that survey. So each one of these dots is the position of a galaxy. We're here, so we've got the radial information from the redshift and projected them here. So the clustering strength is simply the number of pairs of galaxies that you have beyond random. So whenever anybody shows you a correlation function or indeed a power spectrum, your mental image, or at least my mental image, which helps me out tremendously, is the following. Suppose I took my galaxy survey and I threw down a whole load of sticks into that galaxy survey. And I asked, what's the probability of finding a galaxy at both ends of that stick? And is it greater or lower than the probability I would have found two completely random points if I just filled that survey volume with random points uh, as if you'd just thrown darts in a dartboard over that same volume of the sky. If it's more likely that you will find two galaxies at either end of your stick compared to two of these random points, you say that there is strong clustering on the scale of your stick length. If it's less likely that you find two galaxies, one at either end of your stick compared to the random points, then it's uh, a low level of clustering on that scale. And formally, this idea of having more or fewer pairs of galaxies is given by the correlation function, which you can define as the excess probability of finding pairs of galaxies in two volume elements at either ends of your stick length, length r, uh, compared to what you would expect from a random distribution of the random density. So that's the definition of the correlation function. Formally, this idea of finding excess galaxies compared to the average is encoded in the overdensity, which is defined as the density of galaxies minus the average density divided by the average density. So you've taken the density of galaxies and you've made it dimensionless. You've just taken the excess uh, density of galaxies. Then this correlation function that we had as the sort of the excess probability of finding pairs of galaxies is now given by the two-point function of this overdensity. It's the overdensity at position x times by the overdensity at position x plus r, where you can think of r as being your stick. The Fourier analog, so the Fourier transform of the correlation function is the power spectrum. This now is the two-point function of the overdensity in Fourier space. And so whenever anybody shows me a power spectrum, my mental picture of what this means is that rather than throwing down sticks, I'm throwing down Fourier waves. And I'm asking, what's the density of galaxies along that Fourier wave? OK. The correlation function is the two-point function of the overdensity, positions x1 and x2. x2 is x1 plus r. Because we have statistical homogeneity in the universe, we think the universe statistically on large scales looks the same wherever we are. It doesn't matter whereabouts we put that stick, we still have the same clustering expected. Because of statistical isotropy in the universe, it doesn't matter what direction that stick is in, we still have the same probability, excess probability of finding pairs of galaxies. So this two-point correlation function is now a function simply of stick length, not where the stick is and not where the angle of that stick is, out there in the universe. And so here is an example of a correlation function, r squared times psi, uh, this psi, against the stick length here, and you see that it contains features. In fact, it contains the same sort of features that we see in the CMB power spectrum, or indeed the CMD, CMB angular correlation function. The power spectrum is exactly the same from statistical isotropy and homogeneity. This two-point function of the overdensities in Fourier space 
becomes a scalar function just of the, the wave number uh, of the Fourier modes. And so here's an example power spectrum. And again, if you divide by a smooth model, you can pick up features, the acoustic features, like in the cosmic micro background. Now these, um, the power spectrum and the correlation function do have units. Uh, sorry, the, the power spectrum has units, the correlation function does not. The power spectrum written in this form can be made dimensionless by adding in a K cubed. And then this is sometimes called uh, capital, del, uh, capital delta squared. So sometimes you'll see I'll show a power spectrum as capital delta squared and sometimes as power P of K. These are the two-point functions. The reason they're so important is that for a Gaussian random field, and we think that for a good reason that the galaxies or indeed the matter in the universe forms a Gaussian random field, then these two-point functions are statistically complete in that they contain all of the information about that field. If you don't have a Gaussian random field, for example, on small scales, the phases become correlated, uh, then uh, the two-point function is no longer complete. And so these are uh, plots I stole from a very old talk by Alex Delay, and they show um, density fields with the same power spectrum, but in this one, the phases of the, the Fourier modes are correlated, and in this one, the Fourier modes have random phases. And so you can see that although they have the same power spectrum, they have very different clustering behavior. But on large scales, we think the two-point functions do contain all of the information, and they contain a lot of the cosmological information. Okay. Any questions on the basics of clustering? Yes. Yeah. I will repeat the questions so we can save you. Yeah. Uh, why do you prefer the correlation correlation instead of three-point correlation? Okay. That's okay. That's a very good question. The question was, why the two-point and not the three-point? So if you think about drawing a set of Gaussian random numbers, what do you need? You need the variance. And that's all you need. So then you can create a string of Gaussian random numbers with just the variance. You don't need to know the three-point. We're, we're in a very, very similar situation here in that we've defined what's called a Gaussian random field, and that Gaussian random field is defined by just the two-point functions, which act like the variance. When you go to small scales, particularly in the nonlinear evolved field, then there is information in the three-point. So the, once you have an evolved pattern of galaxies that looks something more like this, there are filaments, sheets, and voids, then the three-point function, which is zero in a Gaussian random field, becomes non-zero and there is information. Okay? All right. Yep. Yeah. In practice, okay, so the question here is, when you are looking for excess clustering beyond random, how do you define what's random? And the answer is, when you do a galaxy survey, there's a volume of the universe that you've covered with galaxies. You know what that volume is. Particularly in the angular direction, you can imagine you know where you've pointed the telescope. So you know the RA deck and the locations of the pointings. So you know where you could have observed galaxies. In the radial direction, you have a distribution of redshifts of the galaxies. So you know what that expected distribution should be. And you can combine the two to define the volume of the universe that you've covered. And then you can just randomly choose points in that volume by choosing a random RA deck, allowing for the fact there's a spherical geometry, choosing a random redshift within that distribution, and you can build up a sort of Monte Carlo sampling of the volume that you've observed. And that's what you can use as a random catalog simply to say exactly like for the galaxies, are there two of those random points on each end of a stick? Okay. Okay? Right, this is great. Oh, another question. I'm going to have to rapidly reduce the number of slides I'm going to try and get through. In the determination of the acoustic yeah. any assumption about model? Okay. So the, the question is, in the definition of the acoustic peak, is it purely observational or is there some theoretical dependence? The simple answer to that is wait and see. We're going to move on to that. 
<laughs> okay. Right. So the observed galaxy power spectrum. Here is an equation. It is the simplest equation that you can write down for the power spectrum, the measured power spectrum of the galaxies on very large scales. And I'm going to try and use this as a sort of benchmark when I explain the physics. I'm going to try and come back to this equation and tell you which part of this equation I'm now explaining. So we have the measured galaxy power spectrum. This depends on the wave number of the modes we're looking at. It depends on the angle those wave numbers make to the line of sight. I've told you now statistical isotropy and homogeneity in the universe mean that the power spectrum is isotropic and only depends on one scalar function. That is true out there in the universe. It is not true of the actual galaxy power spectrum we observe because of observational effects that occur along the line of sight. And so consequently, the observed galaxy power spectrum depends not just on the wave number, but also the angle with respect to the line of sight, defined as mu, which is the cosine of the angle to the line of sight. It depends on the redshift of the galaxies that we're observing, here defined by the scale factor. This observation then depends on the power spectrum that we get post-inflation, written here as a simple power law. The transfer function that takes that post-inflation power spectrum takes it beyond recombination into the matter-dominated regime and tells us the shape of the matter power spectrum there. It depends on the linear growth rate that we heard a little bit about uh, yesterday and that I will talk about a bit more. Then it depends on the bias, if there's a difference between the clustering of the galaxies and that of the matter. And it depends on redshift space distortions, which added this term here, which also depends on the line of sight. So, don't give me any questions now on any of these components, because that's what we're going to go through with the rest of the two and a half lectures we have left. We're going to start by looking at this term here, the linear growth rate. Okay. So I think Katrin yesterday uh, did a very good explanation of the linear growth rate. Um, from the Euler, Poisson, and continuity equations, you can drive the differential equation for the linear growth rate, basically how delta that we've defined is evolving with redshift. I just want to take you through a slightly different derivation, uh, which I think gives, gives a little bit of insight into, into exactly how the, the linear growth rate um, comes about and, and how it, it can be calculated simply. So we also saw yesterday, basically, the, the cosmology equation how can be derived from the Einstein equations. And for the background, you can write it in this way. We've got the second derivative of the scale factor of the universe. We've got the Hubble constant, and then we've got the energy density components of the universe. We've got the dark matter density, which has the, the equation of state, which means it evolves in this equation as a to the minus 3. And then we've got some uh, function for dark energy. Here, I've actually written it not as lambda, but as some sort of uh, quintessence model where we've got some equation of state for the dark energy component, which is a function of the scale factor and can change. So if you want the dark energy uh, for this, then this becomes a constant and just becomes omega lambda. Actually, it's minus two omega lambda. Now, there's a theorem called Birkhoff's theorem that says that if you have a spherically symmetric patch of the universe, embedded within an isotropic universe, then that spherical patch behaves itself as a mini-universe. So if we take a spherical perturbation with constant density, and we ask what's the evolution of the scale of that perturbation, then the evolution is given by the same cosmology equation. But now, rather than A, we have AP, the scale of the perturbation. And we have that for all of the components except dark energy, because dark energy, we believe, well, at least in this set of models, doesn't cluster. And therefore, the behavior of the dark energy is dependent on the background, not on the perturbation itself. So if you set up these two equations for two patches of the universe, one an overdense perturbation of radius AP, one a background perturbation, uh, sorry, a, a sphere of the background of radius A. Then you can actually derive from this picture the linear growth rate equation. To do this, 
you can define the overdensity as being the overdensity between the two patches, one sphere of radius AP, one sphere of radius background. And you can take this to first order. Delta, basically, you know, the, the perturbation scale is given by the background scale minus this delta over 3. That's just the first order expansion of this. If you take this, and this is an exercise you can do, it's quite nice, and plug in these two equations, then you get straight out the linear growth equation for delta. It relies on these two terms cancelling. So if you don't have the dark energy being dependent on the background in your perturbation, then you won't get this linear growth rate equation. Similarly, if you have modified gravity, if you have a modification uh, to these equations, which is scale dependent, then obviously you won't get this linear growth equation. Okay. Uh, for an einstein sinner model, nobody worries about this anymore, but it's a really nice solution to this equation. If you plug in omega m equals 1, then you get that delta is proportional to a, and you find that the potential in the universe is constant. You find that the, the degradation of the potential by the expansion of the universe is perfectly balanced by the increase in the potential of structure forming. And it's really neat. I think this is one of the um, nice things about the einstein sinner model that nobody now believes is true or at least fits the, fits the universe. So for lambda models or the dark energy models, uh, you have to solve this equation. You can do it numerically. It's actually reasonably simple to solve numerically, uh, but there are also approximations out there, and here's one for lambda cosmological models that people use quite a lot. Okay. So here's a plot made. I made this by taking that cosmological equation and then solving it numerically for different initial overdensities. Here is, on the black, the evolution of the scale factor, basically A or AP, for a lambda CDM model. And then each of these solid lines shows the evolution of the cosmology, or indeed the perturbation, as if you'd put in a little bit more overdensity initially, and then seen how this um, cosmology evolved. And if you put in a lot of overdensity initially, you find that it has a closed model. Basically, before the dark energy can become important, the dark matter pulls the universe back together. And even though you have dark energy, it doesn't stop you having uh, a collapse uh, of the universe. There is a limit for collapse, and then you have uh, expansion, uh, constant, uh, expansion forever, uh, and so on, uh, until you get to the, the lambda CDM model that we all believe uh, matches observations. So this is solving the full cosmology equation. What does linear growth look like on this plot? Linear growth looks like these dashed lines. And so for solutions that are pretty close to the background, you see that linear growth does remarkably well. But when you have potential of collapse, linear growth works uh, less <coughs> well. So this, I think, and, and the derivation of the linear growth rate from the cosmology equations shows you what linear growth means and what is actually happening uh, when you linearly extrapolate your initial overdensity. What happens to the power spectrum? Here's a power spectrum written in dimensionless form. Uh, here it is a series of different redshifts, redshift 5 to redshift 0. Then linear growth rate, that D term in the big equation that we had, basically just boosts the amplitude of the power spectrum. And then on small scales, linear growth stops working. We get collapse of structures. We get all sorts of nonlinear effects. And the power spectrum increases in amplitude significantly more uh, than uh, the nonlinear growth would uh, give us to expect. And if we divide by the linear model, you can see this even more clearly. And you see that actually power, total power is conserved. So to get this increase in power, it actually has to decrease the power on quasi-linear scales uh, as well. OK. Any questions on the growth rate, the general growth of the power spectrum with time? OK, excellent. Right, let's move on to barren acoustic oscillations. So now, back in this equation, we're now talking about this term here. Uh, we're talking about something that happens in the transfer function. So what I'm going to talk about is, is very similar to the effects that also give you the acoustic peaks in the cosmic microwave background. 
In fact, here's a plot of the, a model uh, CMB power spectrum uh, compared to a model large-scale structure matter power spectrum. The large-scale structure matter power spectrum has divided by, been divided by a smooth model just to highlight features. And what you see is that the acoustic features here in the CMB power spectrum are related to the acoustic features that you see in the large-scale structure power spectrum. In fact, there's a phase offset, and there is also a, another offset. The phase offset comes about uh, because the, the peaks in the matter depend on where the velocity is at a maximum, whereas the peaks in the, the radiation depend on where the actual density or the radiation density is at a maximum. There is also an asymmetric projection because your cosmic microwave background is on the surface of a sphere. When you observe fluctuations in the CMB, you're observing fluctuations, 3D fluctuations that are projected onto that 2D spherical surface. So any projections of larger wavelength can be projected to smaller wavelengths as they then cross this spherical surface that we see. So there's an asymmetric projection that we see as well. But otherwise, the physics that goes into the production of these, particularly the acoustic oscillations in both, is remarkably similar. Okay. So I'm just going to go through the configuration space. That's the, the real space definition of how the acoustic oscillations come about. I will then tell you about the Fourier space one and get you to think about how the two are related. So let's suppose that post-inflation, we have a single perturbation in the universe. And this perturbation is composed of all of the material that there is in the universe. There's a perturbation, adiabatic perturbation, in all of the material. There is radiation, there is dark matter, there is baryonic matter, uh, there, are, there is um, neutrinos. And they are all um, there in a single density spike, an otherwise homogeneous universe. And so this is at a redshift of 82,000. If we look at a redshift of about 7,000, what we find is that the neutrinos have streamed away. They haven't felt the gravitational attraction of the perturbation very much at all. They're relativistic particles. They've just streamed away. And that's shown by this green line moving away from that perturbation. Sorry, I should have said, this is, this is a plot of radius, radius away from the center of our perturbation versus the mass profile of the perturbation. This is R squared rho, which is why it drops down to zero, uh, R equals zero. So the neutrinos, the, the green line streams away. The baryonic material and the radiation, the gas and the photons, are coupled together. They're coupled together through um, Compton scattering. Uh, actually, it's, it's in the, the inelastic limit, so it's Thompson scattering for the most part. Uh, then they are coupled together, and they form a um, wave which is blown out by radiation pressure in a spherical shell around your initial perturbation. The dark matter stays where you had your initial perturbation, and that just grows through gravity. So the redshift of 1400, the neutrinos still stream away from the perturbation. The spherical shell of material is blown away from your initial perturbation, and your dark matter is left within the perturbation. It feels the gravitational attraction of this spherical shell, so it actually builds up a profile. But in general, it stays there, centered on your initial perturbation. A redshift of around 1,000, you get recombination. Atomic elements form, the Compton scattering breaks down. The photons now travel through the baryonic material. And consequently, the radiation decouples from the baryonic material, and it streams away. It streams away exactly as the neutrinos stream away. It's now relativistic particles just going away from the perturbation. And what you're left with at a redshift of 480 or redshift of 80 is a spherical shell in the baryonic material around your original perturbation, which now has a profile in the matter. And what happens from a redshift of 80 down to a redshift of 10 or so is that the gravitational um, attraction, basically the diffusion of the particles, means that both the dark matter and the baryonic material feel the gravitational attraction of each other, and they then form a profile uh, which collectively has a peak where you had your original density peak, but now has a spherical shell around it consisting of the baryonic, and the dark matter, baryonic material and the dark matter. And the radius 
of this spherical shell is the co-moving sound horizon at recombination. It's basically how far your spherical shell got out before recombination. And it's around a co-moving 150 megaparsecs or so. OK. So this picture, we had an initial density spike in an otherwise homogeneous universe. We saw that it became transformed. Um, basically, this is within the era of the transfer function into a spherical profile with a spherical shell, 3D spherical shell, uh, around it at around 150 megaparsecs. If we look at the correlation function, we see a peak in the correlation function corresponding to this shell. And that's where you have one galaxy forming at the center of where you had the original perturbation, and one galaxy forming within this spherical shell. It's slightly more likely than if the galaxies were forming either away from or within that particular shell. And that gives a bump in the observed correlation function. So the picture is, for a single perturbation, we've got this spherical shell being blown out, leaving us with this profile around it. This um, basically wavelength of the, of the shell, the distance between the center and the shell, is the co-moving sound horizon at recombination, which I said before. Uh, it's actually given by a simple equation. This is very early universe. You don't have to worry about dark energy. You can basically just integrate up the, the sound speed of the material uh, over the distance of time taken uh, from inflation through to recombination. It gives you this co-moving sound horizon around 150 megaparsecs. So now, this picture works for a single perturbation homogeneous universe. You all know the universe is not homogeneous with a single density perturbation within it. You think about the post-inflation power spectrum of material, then there's a whole series of density spikes and density features. Now mentally think about around each one of those density spikes and features, this spherical shell being blown out, and linearly superimpose in your mind a spherical shell being blown out by all of these different perturbations within your universe. Then that's actually what we think happens. And um, well, when you go from the correlation function with the spike in it to the power spectrum, you have uh, oscillations in the power spectrum. And the standard way to think about having those oscillations in the power spectrum is in a Fourier space picture. OK. so. All right, here's what I want you to do. In the back of your mind, keep together this picture of having a linear superposition of all these spherical waves being blown out from perturbations. Now I'm going to tell you a different description of acoustic peaks in the power spectrum. And it gives you exactly the same physics. And the idea here is the following. If you have a perturbation of a particular scale, then you have two competing processes forming that perturbation. One of them is gravity, pulling that perturbation in, making it grow. And one of them is radiation pressure. Basically, this is in the radiation-dominated uh, era in the universe. Radiation pressure is a very strong force. It can actually increase the size of perturbations. So you have two competing forces, one making perturbations get bigger and one making perturbations get smaller. And in fact, it shouldn't surprise you that you can actually get oscillations in perturbations in this picture. Now, again, Compton scattering, basically the radiation pressure only works before recombination. Post-recombination, atomic elements form the, the radiation can go away without doing anything to the material in the universe. So there's a finite amount of time within which you can have these oscillations. The frequency with which these oscillations happen depends on the size of the perturbation. If you have a big perturbation, then these oscillations happen slowly. If you have a small perturbation, then the oscillations happen quickly. So if you have a particular size of perturbation where there's just enough time for half an oscillation, so just enough time to gravity to win but not radiation pressure to push it back out, then you get a peak in the overdensity. If there's just enough time for gravity to attract things and the radiation pressure to blow them out again maximally, then you get a trough. You get that particular scale of perturbation doesn't have a very increased size of the overdensity at recombination. So as you look on different scales, you pick up these peaks and troughs, 
And that gives you the oscillations in the power spectrum, the oscillations in the CMB power spectrum. Everybody okay with these two different pictures, right? One, we've got peaks and troughs, oscillating balls on strings, springs. And in one, we've got the linear superposition of spherical waves over a whole series of different perturbations. These two pictures describe exactly the same physics. Okay? If you think about the superposition of spherical waves on these different scales of perturbations, and then see what happens in a time series, you will see you will come out with this oscillating balls on springs picture. So these two pictures are different physical representations of the same physical process that's happening. And it leads to, in the power spectrum, post-recombination, these oscillations, it leads to the same oscillations in the CMB power spectrum. Okay. Everybody happy about the physics that's building up barren acoustic oscillations in the matter distribution? Any questions? Okay. Ten minutes left. Time for one more topic. Galaxy clustering is a standard ruler. So I want to now look at the projected clustering. I want to look at these terms here. So we've set up in the early universe, pre-recombination, these oscillatory features. I've said that they will, you know, because you've got matter distributed in this way, the matter will form galaxies. So your distribution of galaxies will also fo follow these acoustic features themselves. So what does that mean when we actually look at galaxies? Well, when we observe the power spectrum, we actually measure galaxies' redshifts and angles. When I've plotted any plots of galaxies or power spectra, they are all co-moving galaxy distributions or co-moving power spectra. So I've taken the redshifts of the galaxies and I've translated them through into distances to the galaxies, assuming some cosmological model, and I've done that using the standard equation for the co-moving distance as a function of the redshift to the galaxies. The acoustic feature is on such large scales that we expect the evolution of it, the cosmological evolution of it, to go with the co-moving expansion. So physically, in physical distances, you've got the universe is expanding, the universe is getting bigger. So this physical separation of two galaxies at the acoustic scale will grow with the co-moving expansion of the universe. But we've got this projection term to get through to co-moving units. So if you observe galaxies at a series of different redshifts, you would expect this acoustic feature that you observe in physical units to be, oh sorry, in co-moving units, to be at the same separation. So if you observe a series of galaxies at a redshift of 0.2, you expect to pick up the acoustic feature at 150 h to the minus 1 megaparsec, oh, 150 megaparsecs co-moving separation. If you observe a set of galaxies at a redshift of 1, you expect to pick up the acoustic feature at 150 co-moving megaparsecs. But you're measuring angles and redshifts. So to translate those angles and redshifts into this co-moving unit and get the co-moving unit acoustic peak to be the same at a series of different redshifts is the same thing as using the galaxy survey as a standard ruler to get that projection to be consistent. So here it is. In detail, surveys measure angles and redshifts. And to estimate the co-moving clustering, we have to use some sort of fiducial cosmological model. You have to pretend you know what the true cosmological model for the universe is in order to change those angles and redshifts into co-moving distances. Once you've done that, you can think of this as a sort of data compression step. You've taken your redshifts and angles, and you've compressed them into giving you co-moving uh, units for some fiducial cosmology. Then what you find is that actually what you've done to go from redshifts and angles to distances is slightly different in the radial direction for the BAO peak than in the angular direction. So we can always treat this BAO separation, the separation of pairs of galaxies, as being small compared to cosmological evolution. 
So in the radial direction, in order to get the peak where we expect it to be, we've had to change the Hubble parameter. The Hubble parameter is the, basically the derivative of distance with respect to redshift, dd by dz. We've observed dz, delta z, the redshift separation of this pair of galaxies. Our theory is telling us delta d. So to get the model, the observation and the model to agree, we need to change uh, the Hubble parameter, h. In the angular direction, we're measuring angles. Our model is in co-moving units, so these two are related by the angular diameter distance. So this translation from redshifts and angles through to distances gives us potentially, if we get our fiducial cosmological model H wrong, and we get it wrong in a different way to we get DA wrong, then the clustering we observe will not be isotropic. It might be squashed in the radial direction compared to the angular direction because we've got this term right and this term wrong. We might have got them both wrong, but there could still potentially be a squashing if we get the combination of these two wrong. And this idea that if we get this cosmological model wrong and then we see some anisotropic clustering is what's known as the alcock paczynski test, as they first presented this as a cosmological test. And it depends on basically the ratio of these two um, parameters. So, when we have our correlation function of galaxies, and we measure this peak in pair separations of galaxies, at this co-moving scale corresponding to the uh, sound horizon at recombination, and we translate from our angles and redshifts into distances, if we get that translation wrong, we will move this peak. We will move it to different scales, right? If this is wrong and if this is wrong, you'll be moving this peak of the BAO scale. Uh, as an example, think about if you've got the distance redshift relation, you'd actually put in a distance redshift relation that was twice the true value of it then your excess pairs of galaxies separated by this co-moving sound horizon would now be double what they would be. So when you measured the correlation function from those galaxies, you would find a peak, not a 100 h to the minus 1 megaparsecs, but a 200 h to the minus 1 megaparsecs. This, in essence, is the idea behind using BAO as a standard ruler. The fact that it's different in the radial and the angular direction means that if you had a survey where the pairs of galaxies were distributed just geometrically randomly, then you would constrain from your peak in the observed correlation function a distance relationship that included twice this compared to this because there are twice as many pairs separated in the angular direction compared to the radial direction. Okay. There is a question about this alcott paczynski effect, this idea that you are translating from redshifts to distances and that potentially you're therefore causing some anisotropic observed feature. And people have asked, people asked a few years ago, whether you could use this alcott paczynski effect on all different scales, okay? So we're at the moment, we're using it mainly for barren acoustic oscillations. There's a question of, can you take any structure in the universe and does the same principle apply? If you take a void or if you take uh, pairs of galaxies on small separations and you translate from the redshifts of those pairs or redshifts of the galaxies that mark out the void into distance, and if you get the cosmology wrong, do you see all of your voids in the universe that you think on average should be spherically, is um, spherically isotropic around the line of sight? Should they, in fact, be squashed, or in one way or the other, that would tell you that you got the cosmology wrong when you translated from the redshifts to the distances. The same thing for the isolated pairs. And the problem with this, and the problem with this for isolated small-scale pairs of galaxies, is the following. If you have a cluster or a virialized object, is that object expanding itself with the expansion of the universe? 
The answer is no. That object lives in static space-time. That object, the collapsed object, has basically divorced itself from Hubble expansion, and it is just a static object sitting there without the objects within it moving away from each other or towards each other with cosmological expansion. If you had two different cosmological models, if Katrina had given you two different simulations of cosmological models that each had static clusters of galaxies within them, you would not be able, from looking at the dynamics of those, oh, sorry, the, the large scale dynamics of those clusters in terms of the Alcott Pachinsky effect, to tell those two cosmological models apart. Because those two clusters of galaxies would both be living within patches of space time. In fact, if there were no peculiar velocities, then the redshifts that you measured for all of the galaxies within the clusters, for example, would be exactly the same. So redshift, in this case, no longer tells you the distances to the galaxies through Hubble expansion. Redshifts only equate to distances when the objects are moving with the Hubble expansion. If you have static objects, that's no longer true. So this fact limits small-scale alcott pachinsky tests. Basically, for small local pairs of galaxies that have collapsed into static space-time, that pair of galaxies will have the same cosmological redshift, and any difference in the redshifts will simply tell you their relative peculiar velocity with respect to each other. So this is probably the final plot I'm going to show, which will please the organizers, in this lecture at least. Okay, so this is a plot, this is a plot that um, we made from the Millennium Simulation. It takes the separation of pairs of matter particles here on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, it plots the average pairwise velocity in co-moving units. If you had a pair of matter particles within the this simulation that were moving with cosmological expansion, then you would get zero average pairwise co-moving velocity. The velocity of the pairs would just be moving with the expansion of the universe. So there differential velocity, if they lay on this line, this co-moving line here, would tell you the Hubble expansion rate. Basically, if you looked at the difference between their redshifts, delta Z, then it would give you delta D by mu multiplying by the Hubble parameter in simple picture. If you had a static solution, then you would get objects that lay on this blue line. So these are objects that have a co-moving pairwise velocity, which is minus h times d. This is exactly what's required to counter the expansion rate and give you static objects. And, what, and linear theory, the linear theory we discussed at the start of the lecture, gives you this dashed line here. And what you find is that, on average, pairs of matter particles within the simulation give this kind of behavior. They initially follow, on large scales, linear theory, they break three from linear theory, there's a turnaround point, and then they tend towards the static solution. And if you had a different cosmological model, then you would see the same sort of picture of linear growth turnaround, followed by tendency towards the static cosmological model. And this explains why uh, you can't um, use small scale pairs in. Um, to do these kind of cosmological Alcott-Pachinsky tests. Right, I just want to do one more. <laughs> then we finish with this. Okay. So, <coughs> I've forgotten I have this slide. All right. So we can't do Alcott-Pachinsky on small scales. We can do it with BAO on large scales because there the separation of galaxies is expected to still be dominated by the Hubble expansion rate. So, we have a power spectrum or correlation function which is now because of this differential behavior in the projection, dependent on the line of sight. If you look along the line of sight of the power spectrum, you get a slightly different power spectrum than across the line of sight, if you've got your fiducial cosmology wrong. So to analyze this, what we tend to do 
is that rather than looking the full, at the full power spectrum as a function of k and mu, we look at moments of the power spectrum, where we have some sort of function f, and we integrate over the power spectrum uh, multiplied by this f of mu. And we usually define it so that this f of, u, f of mu is normalized such that integrating just over the f of mu gives you 1. So you'll probably most be familiar with this if I tell you that this is the way that you define the monopole and the quadrupole. The monopole has, I know, I know, f of mu equals 1. Uh, the quadrupole of f of mu equals, well, the half, 3 mu squared minus 1 in this equation. If you take these kind of moments of the power spectrum, then you can imagine that if you took a moment where f of mu was only pointed along the line of sight direction, then you would only pull out, basically, alpha parallel, the ratio of the Hubble parameters between the fiducial model and the true cosmological model. If you took f of mu only in the angular direction, then you would only measure the angular diameter distance. In general, we take more um, complicated functions, f of mu, such as the monopole and quadrupole, and then these give us some combination of, um, basically, alpha parallel, alpha perpendicular, which is what we actually then measure with the Baron acoustic oscillation peak position. So if you measure the correlation function from one of these moments of the, oh, sorry, if you measure the power spectrum from one of these moments of the power spectrum, uh, and then look at the BAO peak position or acoustic wave position within that power spectrum, uh, then you find that the position is given by some combination of alpha parallel and alpha mu, yeah, perpendicular rather, like this. Okay. So this is the last piece in the puzzle, if you like, that we need to understand the, the Baron acoustic oscillation feature um, and how it appears when we measure the correlation function from a galaxy survey uh, in projection. And then the next lecture, we're going to start uh, by looking at measuring the anisotropic clustering itself. We're going to look at reconstruction of the linear perturbations. We're going to look at recent results on Baron acoustic oscillations and then move on to some of the other physics that can be got out uh, from galaxy clustering. Okay. Thank you. Do we so, have time for questions uh, on the last bit? We have time for one very quick and urgent question. <laughs> Is there a name? <laughs> right. If, uh, if it turns out that the dark matter is not a cold dark matter, but yep. something like with the interacting of warm matter, uh, how much this very acoustic oscillation will change, and how much room, or how strong are the constraints from VAO to these other models for dark matter? Okay, that's a very interesting question. <laughs> um, so in general, the, the effect of having warmer dark matter is not through the Baron acoustic oscillation process. It's through another process that I'm hoping to be able to talk about in the next lecture, uh, which defines um, basically the, the overall power spectrum change of slope. So the Baron acoustic oscillation feature, because it's mainly dealing with radiation and baryonic material coupled together, is only reasonably weakly dependent on exactly what the dark matter is doing. But there's this other process there in the power spectrum which is more dependent, and that's what gives us better constraints on warmness of dark matter. I'll talk about the next time. Okay? Okay, so let's thank Will again.